Oh, we're back, we're back, we're back. And this is a real pleasure. Two of the, the great friends of the show, Plenary Session. I've got Dr. Christopher Booth, professor of medicine, Kingston, Ontario, Queen's University. And I've got Aaron Goodman, also known as the legendary Papa Heem on Twitter. Aaron and Chris, it's a pleasure to have you both on this episode. Thanks, Manai. Uh, always a fan of the show, and it's always great to catch up uh, on YouTube and by telephone, and certainly to have uh, Aaron involved in this discussion. This is going to be terrific. So let me let me say the title of your paper. It's out now, Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology. It's called Practicing on the Edge of Oncology When Standard of Care Feels Uncomfortable. And this is this is really a splendid article, and it really merges, I think, the experiences of a consummate hematologist with a consummate oncologist. And the one-liner, and then I'll let you both kind of take talk about it, but the one-liner I see is there are some things in oncology that we feel pressure to do because a number of our peers do it. But when you look at the evidence, you find the evidence is often lacking and you find yourself a bit of an outlier. We, I think we've all felt this to some degree, at least the three of us and maybe many of the listeners. And, and it's really about kind of grappling with that space when you don't do or do something that your peers don't do. So why don't I start with you, Chris? Why don't you talk about maybe the feeling you've had, what led you to this, this, this example you use in the paper, which is really powerful. Let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, thanks, Vinay. So um, I'm trying to think about how I met Aaron, but I think it might have been through you. I think Aaron wrote something about... Uh, being a junior staff hematologist at a conference or a tumor board and, and feeling a bit uncomfortable because you disagree with, you know, all the experts in the room who are much, you know, older and perhaps wiser than him, although that remains, I guess, to be debated. <laughs> and it resonated with me. I didn't know Aaron, but I, I think I wrote to you and said, Benai, can you please connect me with this guy, Papa Heem? And, Papa and Heem, Aaron, yeah. Aaron and I had a great discussion and realized that while I didn't know anything about lymphoma or dose adjusted chemotherapy. Um, I probably don't need to actually based on what Aaron teaches me. But anyhow, <laughs> what resonated was uh, what I think he, you know, Aaron really hit the nail on the head when he articulated this feeling of discomfort where, you know, we pride ourselves in providing high quality evidence based care that's consistent with guidelines. And it's this uncomfortable feeling where um, we don't necessarily agree with the guidelines. And all of us have an uncomfortable feeling when we're doing treatments where there's really no evidence to support. It's a bit of a gray zone. And that's, you know, a context where we just have to use our best clinical judgment. But I think the examples we write about, and I'd be interested for, for listeners um, to your podcast to kind of add to the list, because I'm yeah. sure there's, you know, dozens of other treatments out there where there actually is evidence. And uh, the evidence is very clear. And for some reason, these treatments are still on guidelines and we keep doing them. And maybe we shouldn't be. And I mean, maybe a theme we can come back to is, I think both for Aaron's example and mine, in the early days, maybe the evidence looked, you know, kind of promising, and it maybe made sense that that was a standard practice for a while. But at least for the examples we, we write about, eventually, the evidence matures. Um, I think some hoser wrote about this once called medical reversal. But anyhow, the evidence accumulates, and maybe we need to revisit um, what the practices once were. So those are just maybe some introductory comments. Aaron, Aaron how, what's your recollection about how this came together? Yeah. So uh, again, yeah. Thanks for having me back on the show. I love being on. Um, you know, uh, Vinay said us. You know, he, he told me about you uh, uh, that you guys knew each other and that you'd read some of my tweets and that I read about kind of the stuff you were interested in. And we had an introductory call and where we retold our stories uh, for you, uh, Avastin, which you'll get into, and for me, uh, dose-adjusted epoch. And uh, it felt good, uh, at least for me as a junior uh, professor, to know that I wasn't alone with these feelings. Uh, and that other uh, more senior professors uh, and oncologists uh, shared these views. And that's where we started to have the discussion about putting together our, our current paper. And I can at least, you know, I can start with, uh, you know, my current example. So yeah, I, I was, uh, yeah. so I'm a bone marrow transplant <laughs> hematologist and, um, uh, you know, all throughout fellowship, uh, um, you know, uh, we learn how to treat diseases, but you don't really have, at least for me, you can't really dive into the literature like hardcore, like you want to, there's so much to learn and you're learning everything about every disease is you really just want to have a general understanding, learn some kind of algorithms, learn some side effects and, 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 and then get to practice. And, uh, so you, you know, for aggressive lymphomas, mainly diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, you know, we would treat some with our shop and some with this dose adjusted, uh, uh regimen called dose adjusted EPOC-R. Uh, really briefly, what that is, is it's basically 
Uh, traditional RCHOP is every three weeks. I think most oncologists are, are good with it. It has a predictable toxicity profile, fairly convenient for the patient. And um, despite numerous attempts, it is the king uh, uh, of, uh, of cancer. I mean, it's then and again, never been beaten by anything uh, uh, in the treatment of aggressive B-cell lymphomas. Uh, a dose-adjusted EPOC-R is basically a five-day chemotherapy regimen um, where uh, four days of it are infusional uh, chemotherapy. It has the same agents as CHOP, but they add a topicide, and the doses are uh, increased every cycle on purpose to get the ANC, the neutrophil count, to hit a certain threshold. You're really maximizing the myelosuppression in a you know, if you read it, it's supposedly a safe manner, uh, uh, and you adjust the uh, chemotherapy based off each cycle. And um, um, it's more chemotherapy, clearly, and it's a little bit of a pain. Um, many places require admission for it. And um, uh, even if you do it outpatient, it's a pump, and they got to come in five days in a row. Um, um, so it's a more cumbersome uh, regimen. And um, just like all of oncology, and this is, I, as Chris said, please share examples. This was studied in phase one and two studies, and this was the bee's knees. I mean, this was the, <laughs> I mean, this stuff looked promising. I mean, it was dominating lymphoma in these single arm studies. Uh, the response rates were high. Uh, the, the PFS seemed great. The cure rates seemed good. And um, we were happy about it and excited. And we knew that diffuse large B cell lymphoma, kind of like any lymphoma, it's many diseases. And uh, then I and I have talked about this, you know, the more we learned about a disease, the more we separate out into different risk categories and we call these new entities. And uh, uh, there are certain subtypes of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that have genomic rearrangements called double hit, or they express more BCL2 in MYC, or they have more extranodal disease, high LDH that were higher risk. We know that. So we were like, this chemo is better. It seems to work better. These higher risk patients don't do as well with our shop. Let's give more chemo. That's what we need to do. Bad disease biology, we can overcome that with more chemo. Uh, uh, and it was adopted. And um, this is what we were giving. Uh, in at least five to seven years, we were giving it, not just to this double hit entity, which we'll talk about, but to like anything that kind of was like, yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a little, right? I mean, right yeah, for yeah. People, were, people give it, they get a little nervous. They say, let's so, just give it. Let's just yeah, give it. Yeah, let's crank up yeah. that atopicide. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, and I get it. You got a crap, a bad disease and you're feeling scared about it. We know more chemo might kill these diseases. I mean, that's how transplant works, right? You escalate the chemotherapy. So we were giving it for just about everything. I was doing it. That's how I was trained. Um, and um, we were admitting patients to the hospital at the time, and we were doing it. And then finally, you know, a few years ago, or not, I might even be three, the CalGB study by Bartlett came out in JCO, where they did the randomized study to answer this question, despite many had already thought they knew the answer, right? We've never seen that before in oncology, where we... <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so they do the study and they showed no difference in response rate and they showed no difference in PFS. So not even in crap, in surrogate endpoints that you write so much, they couldn't even show any difference in those. Uh, and then overall survival was no different, but they did show something important. Although I always argue you do not need a randomized clinical trial to show what they showed. Basically toxicity. they showed more toxicity. And I always say, you don't need a randomized trial for that. It's, if you add more chemo to chemo, you're, there's going to be more toxicity. It's just, impossible to not really decrease the toxicity. So there was more significant febrile neutropenia, more mucositis, uh, more neuropathy, and they didn't even look at it, but it's more of a pain in the butt for patients to get. Um, and I'm sure if we follow long enough, there's probably more leukemia uh, from the atopicide. So um, um, that was enough for me. I was like, I'm done. And yet we were still, then, you know, the doctors were like, well, we were wrong. Let's just give it to this double hit group. They're even worse. You know, the double expressors, okay, mainly our chops fine for that. They proved us wrong, but the double hit, surely they need this atopicide. So it's still in our guidelines, our NCCN. It's still discussed at tumor boards and everyone's given it. And um, I was uncomfortable because I know for sure and had a randomized data that it was not benefiting. And that's where I started to, to change. And, uh, you know, this is where, I you know, Chris can now expand, but how do you have this conversation with your patient? who has double hit lymphoma, where if they see any expert in the world who's way well known more than me, I mean, yeah, I'm Papa Heem, they don't care about that. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm a knowledgeable lymphoma doctor, but I'm definitely not, you know, I'm not designing all the lymphoma trials. I don't claim to do that. I, you know- Celgene um, does that for us. Don't worry yes, about you're that. Right. But, you know, I acknowledge <laughs> that, you know, there are people who've done way more lymphoma than me, uh, have a dedicated lymphoma clinic that I don't. And I don't pretend that I'm that. I do think I'm Knowledgeable, but, no, yeah. Yeah. but Chris, before you jump in, let me just toss on a few more logs on this fire. Um, Cause I think he did a great job of kind of pointing out the, the troubles here. 
It's infusional, which you know, you know, you guys from Jiang, we learned that from you, Chris. We learned that from you, five of you. We're, we're spread that out, put it on a right, pump. Right. Um, we add a drug, obviously, that's better. But I think the other thing to add to what Aaron is saying is that this is a space, lymphoma, where this isn't the first time we've been on this merry-go-round. In the 70s, 80s, we had promacytobom. We all thought it was better than CHOP. And then Rick Fisher had the 93 NEJM study that shows it's a tie. We had, you know, Mbacod. We had other multi-drug regimens, more toxic, more cumbersome. Uh, couldn't beat CHOP. CHOP is the king. Now I guess they say Polo is the king, but we'll learn about that. We'll go put Polo to the test. Okay, but CHOP is the king. Our CHOP once every 21 days, just one day, so convenient. Now you got people coming in, they get the R, they get this infusion, then they get the, they get the cyclophosphamide at the end, then they got to get um, you know GCSF and keep giving that. And then you got to keep checking them at least three times a week, their CBC, sometimes in the hospital a week at a time. It's cumbersome. And then half the time, some of these docs, they don't properly dose adjust. They're not even dose adjusting right. So what are you doing? Um, so I think it's you know, logistically a headache. It's a headache for the patient. And the only randomized data is null. And then of course people say, well, it would have worked, would have worked in that subgroup. You know, that's the favorite thing. Chris, let's hear about your example. And yeah, so I'll, yeah. thanks. So I'll give my example and then it'll be good to come back to see, because I think Aaron and I, despite being completely different diseases, contexts, generations, specialties, uh, I, we actually have a very similar approach to, to how we kind of address this. Um, so uh, I think Vinay, you kidded me about this and you're like, dude, why are you writing about such an old drug? You're an old oncologist. So Bevacizumab, <laughs> so this came out, you know, this, this was hot when I was training. So circa 2004, 2005, Aaron Goodman was probably an aspiring rock and roll star in middle school. Vinay was a philosopher in the Northeast US. Um, and I was kind of a medical oncology trainee at Princess Margaret Hospital. And uh, it was the early days of the molecular era. And so we had a targeted drug, no more of this cytotoxic chemotherapy stuff. And it came out in the initial papers, um, you know, look, looked appealing, right? There was a five month survival benefit in the Hurwitz trial. And then there was a two month benefit in the second line in G. Antonio. And then I trained and, you know, everyone said, oh, IFL is too toxic. Don't give it. We've moved to the infusional approach. Um, and then what, what happened was there was the big, uh, there's a trial, KPOX, Z-Lock, uh, KPOX, Fulflox, plus or minus Bev. And it was a completely negative trial. I mean, it showed a one month improvement in PFS with a p-value below 0.05. And it showed a no. non-significant one month improvement in overall survival. In my mind, it was just, it was a negative trial. This and is Lensalt's JCO 2008. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was presented at ASCO, and I was super junior, and I actually got up in the auditorium after Vogel from New York and asked a question. And I said, you know, Dr. Saltz, you know, do you think it's possible that in the context of modern chemotherapy, when we're giving bevacizumab with the best chemotherapy we've got, maybe it just doesn't work. Maybe the other trials... There was a benefit because we we're giving it to substandard chemotherapy and he was and him and i actually i, I wrote letters to the editor back and forth with him and, and you know as as typical with, with dr salts he was in, in, you know extremely gracious and uh you know took my question and had a slightly different perspective but i, I think uh you know I, I think there was some some reasonable points there to wonder so this was still, you know, this is like 2008, but it was so entrenched by then in standard practice and it has remained entrenched. And since then there's been some other trials that have come out that have consistently shown in colorectal cancer, when you give it, um, you know, when it's compared to a placebo or observation and you're giving it with traditional or, you know, current cytotoxic chemotherapy regimens, it really has no benefit. And this has been replicated in almost every other solid tumor. Uh, I mean, it's probably one of the most studied drugs. And, you know, Benai, you and I have written about this in, mm -hmm. in our paper about multiplicity. Yeah. Um, and, and so either the drug doesn't work at all, we're just finding random highs and lows based on statistical <laughs> fluke and multiplicity, or it's just an extremely marginal drug in a whole bunch of tumors, or maybe it helps a few people that have a specific molecular form of colorectal cancer that we just don't know about yet. But either way, it provides very little, if any, benefit to all of our patients. Now, it doesn't make people feel sick, but it does have a risk of bowel perforation, thrombosis, Stroke. hypertension, proteinuria, et cetera, et cetera. And it has huge cost implications. So it, it just seems amazing to me that, you know, almost 20 years later, this drug is still standard of practice. There's a hundred billion dollars of sales on this drug. It's, it's number three of all time, only behind 
trastuzumab and rituximab, which are actually drugs that have real benefit. Like those are drugs we probably should be putting our money in. And so, you know, there's a, a famous Canadian oncologist I will not name who referred to bevacizumab as the greatest scam in modern oncology. This was like, you know, 10 years ago and was still kind of a contemporary drug. And I think it just became groupthink. We just adopted it and, and we kind of refused to reject it. Um, so when I was really junior, I felt uncomfortable being an outlier and I would look for any contraindication, hypertension, a previous clot, cardiac events, et cetera, and not use it. But, you know, I would use it with other patients. And then as I became more comfortable in my practice and more data emerged, um, I was more willing to be an outlier and, and have, you know, some very honest discussions with patients. Um, and I think that's where kind of Aaron and I converged in our approach. Maybe we'll speak with that in a moment. But I guess the other problem with retaining these treatments is, um, you know, they become the backbone of every future clinical trial. So it's like once we have these entrenched in practice, it becomes really hard to get rid of it because everything we do in the future adds on to it. So it, it's a really difficult um, scenario, especially, you know, I, I think uh, at Aaron's stage as being, you know, fairly junior faculty, it, it actually takes quite a bit of courage to do that. And I think one of the, the reasons that Aaron and I decided to write this was there's, there's gonna be people that disagree with our perspectives on the evidence for uh, dose-adjusted EPOC and bevacizumab, but I think we mostly write, wrote it just to uh, get this kind of concept out, out in the realm for discussion. That's so well put. Uh, you know, I think it's it's interesting the way we tell ourselves story, Chris, and about Avastin, which is, you know, people say this, they say like, you know, yeah, it, it works with IFL, it didn't work as well with Folfox, and then in Long, you know, it uh, didn't work in Avail, but with Carbopaclitaxel, it works. I was like, yeah, you could tell yourself all this story, it works here with this backbone, not with that, this cancer, not that cancer, it doesn't work in breast, works in brain, works in cervical, the best, or it's possible that they're just some fluke positives because you keep testing the same thing. Yeah. Aaron, we call Avastin um, low toxicity Selenexor. It's a smooth, it goes down smooth, but it smells like Selenexor. So Aaron, what do you say? How do you think about, you know, how do you counsel your patients when you, yeah, what, you're in the room, you know, double hit lymphoma patient, me, let's say, uh, you know, what are you going to tell me? How am I, how are you going to walk me through this decision-making? Yeah, no, this is hard. And now I've, I've done this and uh, I've taken some practice and I, I, you know, now I even try to get the fellows in the room with me when I'm doing stuff like this. They got to um, learn sometime. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of, you know, it's my consent and I've, I've gotten, I think, you know, something I didn't learn so well in fellowship is how to do a good informed consent. And I take like extreme pride now in my informed consents with patients. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I always like starting, and this is how I teach the fellows. I start out with my informed consent is kind of what happens if we do nothing to kind of just really tell our patients what, you know, especially with blood cancers, I'm dealing with pretty aggressive things and we do pretty crazy things in hematologic malignancies. And uh, that, if, you know, without setting the context of what their disease means, it might seem ludicrous to recommend some of the things that we are. So I always like saying, you know, we do nothing, you know, here's someone with a double hit lymphoma, a very aggressive lymphoma. Um, you're not gonna be around probably in a few months. Uh, um, uh, uh, and then I go over what we know. And uh, what we know is that our chop is king in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, but we also know that our chop is suboptimal in double hits. I mean, I, I agree, double hits worse. I'm not going to argue with that. Um, and I, I discussed that in general, double hits um, are uh, can be more chemo refractory, uh, not respond. Um, although we typically know that pretty fast uh, um, within a few cycles, um, and the relapse rates much higher, and that the long term outcomes that you see reported, you know, these 60 to 80 percent cure rates are much lower in double hit, maybe more like 30 to 50 percent. Um, and then um, I discuss, uh, um, you know, what have we done to get around this? And I start discussing more intensive regimens, including EPOC, uh, R. And I discuss that, you know, we really haven't shown in any study uh, that, that, that these more intensive regimens improve upon these outcomes. We haven't. Uh, there are some data sets that disagree with each other. And there's small retrospective studies that show maybe improvement. Uh, uh, and I go over the levels of evidence and I go, really, we have no idea. We just have a feeling that maybe it helps, but the outcomes are actually still pretty bad, regardless of what we right. do. And I, I hammer that home. I go, no matter what we do, the outcomes aren't great. Um, and, and then one I more thing to add, we... you saw Gaurav Gaul, uh, Goyle's um, a paper, Flatiron paper that he presented at EHA this year. Yes. You are you going to talk about this? Yes, I could. Okay. I, yeah, I, I mean, I will talk about that, uh, um, but I, you know, I'll talk about it now. Basically the Flatiron 
uh, which looked at uh, more of a popular, you know, everyone in the Flatiron database of who got RCHOP and dose-adjusted EPOC for double hit lymphoma. There's a pretty, again, level of evidence it's retrospective and, and has limitations, but that's all we got pushing for it. And it was the largest, I believe, collection yep. of these patients. Yep. And it showed no benefit. That's right. Okay. Uh, um, so we now have, you know, four or five papers in slightly different groups, some showing some maybe benefit, some showing none. So clearly we have no idea. And that's what I tell the patients. Uh, and then I go over the facts and we, and the facts are what we know about EPOC, which we know beautifully from the CalGB. And, and I go over the inconvenience of therapy. And then I go over it is not unreasonable to still do EPOC. And I, ha I say, I don't, if a colleague of mine wants to do it, I don't think it's crazy, okay? I think it's wrong and I think it's more toxicity, but I don't think it's crazy. Um, and then I also say, I, I, I always offer second opinions with any of my colleagues or our close colleagues up North in Los Angeles. Uh, and I say, they may very well recommend uh, this alternative therapy. And then we talk about it together. And I will say, I, I have not had one choose EPOC. I, I even had one get second opinion and still they get our chop. Um, so again, this is a rare scenario, but um, I find with that approach and really educating the patients uh, that, that it, it's effective and they tend to agree. Now, someone could say, you can convince the patient to do anything you want, right? You know, that's how we convince people to do allogeneic transplants. It's how you sell it. Um, but I do feel I'm being honest. I'm going over the data the best I can. Uh, and at the end of it, I think the mutual agreement between me and the patients of the understanding of for sure toxicity and really unknown benefits uh, that we agree on the same conclusion, which is our job. The only thing I'll add is um, before Chris, I'll give Chris the last word before we go. But, um, but the only thing I'll add there is, you know, that we always talk about this in like medicine that something has like an unknown benefit, um, but it has like logistic headaches and toxicity. I think the thing that like people don't realize that takes a while to realize in medicine is like the probability that things that have not yet proven superiority in well done studies, the probability that they actually work better, but you just haven't proven it yet versus the probability that you just have deceived yourself into thinking they work better, the latter is like huge. Like most of the things people think work better don't actually work better. And so I agree with everything you said. And in addition to it, if I were to bet, I would put all my poker chips on that it actually is not better than CHOP, even in that subgroup. And we have just deceived ourselves into thinking that. If we did um, a randomized trial, which would be impossible, I agree. Well, they're doing well, it. Well, no, I think they can do it. Yeah. They're, do, they're doing it for, a, what's it called, venetoclax? Yes, yeah, so they, you're right. right? They if, found if, a way to do it for venetoclax. Yeah, if, if they did the randomized <laughs> trial with our choppers EPOC, I mean, no, ch I mean, I'm, I don't think there'd be any benefit other than more toxicity. And you're right. They are doing the randomized trial. And similar with the Avastin story, they've adopted the EPOC yeah. backbone. They're adopting the wrong backbone. Yeah, I know. The they're adding wrong, I venetoclax. Know. I know. This Come is going to be guaranteed. I would the counts are going to go to. Oh, it's going to be neutrophils. It's going to be, I wouldn't enroll in the study. I actually think it will show the combo will yeah, be oh worse. No, uh, no, uh, no. I would not enroll in the study. Chris, you're listening to me, study designers, please change that. <laughs> I agree with Aaron. Chris, um, final thoughts on this issue. It's such a great yeah. article. Let me give one more plug for people can check it out. Practicing on the edge of oncology. And that's really well put. It's the edge of oncology. Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, the example that I wrote about in our essay was, and this just happened, I don't know, six months ago, I had a 70 year old woman, very fit, um, first line metastatic colon cancer. And I think she was uh, either RAS mutant or, or uh, right sided wild type. So an EGFR inhibitor was not um, part of the conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we use full theory first line. So I had a long discussion about full theory, the pros and cons and side effects. And she was very keen to get moving on it. And then at the end, uh, and what I do now is I, I, I separate the antibody from the cytotoxic because I see them as being kind of, you know, separate therapies. They go together, but it's two parts of the informed consent. So she was keen to move ahead with full fury. And then I said, in addition to the chemotherapy drugs, we can add an antibody and the antibody probably won't make you feel sick. Um, but there's a risk of serious side effects, not commonly, but things like heart attack, stroke, blood clots. And then sometimes you can have problems with blood pressure and protein in your urine. Um, and I said, the problem is, is that the most contemporary clinical trial that compared getting the antibody to not getting the antibody uh, showed that there was no improvement in how long you live. Um, we don't think it's going to improve quality of life. And if anything, uh, it might slow down the growth of cancer on your CAT scan by a month or so. Um, and I said, I can't rule out the possibility that maybe there's a small improvement in survival, but if it is, it's measured in weeks. And, and she looked at me and she said, why would anyone take that therapy? And it really, and I've repeated that exact same conversation probably four or five times since then. And with one exception, um, all of my patients, uh, 
you know, say, no, I'm not interested in that. So I think that was the unifying theme is, you know, Aaron and I, we, we recognize that we might be outside uh, guidelines. We're very clear with our patients. We go through it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we try to match the treatment recommendations with the values and preference of our patients. And I guess I'll just close with kind of in the last paragraph of our essay, we say something like, <clears throat> As oncologists, our patients expect us to move very quickly to adopt new therapies when they emerge. But I think it's also worth stating that our, our patients would expect us to have the humility to recognize when treatments that we once believed in might not work quite as well as we think. Chris, that's so well put. And I'll just conclude by saying two things. One, I know you're Canadian because you went to full Fury, not full Fox. And I know you're the senior oncologist in the room because I see all those gray hairs in your beard. So thank you, gentlemen, for doing this. Christopher Booth, Aaron Goodman, a real pleasure. My two favorite people in oncology. Thank you. Thanks, Vinay. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks.